Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. The English domestic summer has come to an end and what an ending it had. Liam Norwell taking 9 for 62 on the final afternoon of the season to keep Warwickshire in Division 1 next summer. We'll be talking about that. The end of the Pakistan-England series, a bit more T20 World Cup related news and we'll be reviewing the summer, picking out our moments, players and matches of the 2022 English season but also hearing yours as well. I'm Yaz Rana, and on today's show, I'm joined in the studio by the managing editor of Wisden.com, Ben Gardner, and the magazine editor of Wisden Cricket Monthly, Joe Harmon. Mark Butcher, who's just landed back from Pakistan, will be joining us later in the show. Let's start with the Pakistan-England T20s. According to the PCB, the 97.35% crowd attendance was the highest ever for an international series to be played in Pakistan. So in total, nearly 200,000 fans saw the seven games live in the grounds. Um, England ended up winning 4-3, comfortably winning the final two matches. Phil Salt blasting a rapid 88 in the sixth game. Milan and Brooks going runs in the seventh. Um, ben, the series was played in conditions different to what we'll see in the World Cup. But do you think England now have a better idea of what their eleven will be for the first game against Afghanistan than they did compared to the start of the series? Yeah, I, th- I think they do, just because Brooke has absolutely nailed his place in it, I guess. Um, in a way, I think probably after game five, they'd maybe a clearer idea than they did after game seven because of Salt's resurgence in those last two games. And he was absolutely brilliant in that sixth game. Um, and you could see it actually from about five balls and you could see how cleanly he was hitting it that he was kind of on the front foot that he knew like had a plan to where to score and that was evident in this in the last game before he got run out as well and I think it's now it's it's a real shootout between Salt and Hales after the series I think they confirmed that Mott confirmed that Butler will keep which I think probably which I think boosts Hales case just enough so I think he will start but I think that's still a contest but beyond that I think they've got a pretty sure uh lineup I think and then the other thing that we really pleased about is just Milan finding some form in the last game of the series I think if he'd have then failed through the three Australia T20s it would have been a question but I think they'd have still been very keen to start him anyway because we know how good he is against fast bowling when it's sort of pacey and bouncy and we know that he's got a, a caliber in Australia as well so I think he, he would have been very likely to start but he's now pretty nailed on as well I think mm. Um, we might as well go straight into it. Joe, what's the what's the 11 that you would pick for the first game? I guess it helps for us that Matthew Mott has confirmed that Ben Stokes will bat at four. Yeah, well, first off, an apology to Ben that seven match series are definitely the way to go. <laughs> he, was, he was absolutely right. They should all be seven match series from now on. Um, yeah, it, it's really hard. I've been thinking about this quite, <laughs> quite a bit and going backs and forwards. So they've said Stokes will bat at four. So I guess we should go with that assumption. I personally wouldn't have Stokes on my side if it was the first game of the World Cup really? tomorrow. I just don't... It's no kind of reflection on him, really, but he's opted not to play T20s a lot over the last year and a half um, for good reasons. And some good players have come through and have done really well. And, and what a player to have on the bench to come through when there's an injury or someone loses form. So it's not Ax Stokes. It's just players are going well. And, I mean, Harry Brook has to play. It's the balance of the side is tricky. So I've gone... So I've picked a side that I do have Stokes in because I think we should go with what England are more likely to pick. Mm. Um, I've gone Butler. I've gone Salt at this stage. I thought that 80-odd just pushed him ahead of Hales, but I agree it's a shootout in Australia in the three-match series against Australia to decide who starts the World Cup. Uh, Milan, Stokes, Brook, Livingston, Moen, Curran, Jordan, Rashid Wood, which is a bit light on the bowling Hmm. You haven't really got a specialist new build bowler and I would like to get Topley in there. So my side, I would bring Topley in for Stokes and push everyone up. I think St- uh, I think Sam Curran at seven is absolutely fine. Jordan at eight is absolutely fine. Hmm. And I think that's a better balanced side. This is the problem with Stokes. He's such a huge cricketer in every sense that you need to get him in there. But I don't think the balance of the side looks as good because I don't think you can rely on him to get through four overs, certainly. Um, he's not a brilliant T20 bowler. He hasn't really got any pedigree in that. His batting has shown form in the past, but quite a long time ago now. So it's an interesting dilemma. It's a good dilemma to have. And I think the three matches in Australia will will make things quite a bit clearer. If Stokes, Stokes will have to play, you know, at least two of them. If he doesn't go well, then do you pick him for the first match? He's, he's a hard player to drop, mm. but... At the moment, I think it's a hard call to justify picking him. It's a weird one. I was looking at his record across T20 cricket. So in T20Is overall, his average is middling at best. He averages 20 with a strike rate of 137. He's only batted above five in T20Is 
a handful of times. His IPL record at four isn't great. He's not batted there. Loads, granted. Um, the, the only time he's really done well at four in T20 cricket was in that spell where he played domestic cricket in New Zealand during the 2017-18 Ashes, mm. um, which wasn't exactly IPL or T20 World Cup level. Um, he's done well at the top of the order occasionally in, in the IPL, but it's a bit of a punt. I guess that, there was that hole in the side before the Pakistan tour, but Duckett has done so well there. You do now actually have a guy who's got um, a record at four that Stokes is going in above. Yeah, that's true. Um, but I do think that, and it's weird because you've got to talk about either Stokes the character or Stokes the cricketer, but I think there are cases for both of them. Obviously, Stokes the character, if it's a World Cup, you just want him at your side because, you know, if it get da- gets down to the end, he's going to do something or at least he's going to be the player who wants to do something, which is a very valuable thing. Uh, but, but even, I think the team balance thing is a not negligible thing because England have struggled with that. I think before when Stokes was in their side more regularly and in ODI cricket, so much of their sort of batting firepower has been based on the fact that they bat so deep as much as, much as how good the guys at the top are. Um, but they've struggled this year when Stokes hasn't been there to know whether to go with a, a sort of a bowling option or a batting option at number six, basically. So Curran and Moeen at six and seven has left them just that little bit light, which has basically meant that they've had some sort of dramatic collapses and sometimes when you've sort of wondered if they would go a bit harder if there was a bit more depth and Stokes at four means that you can have Livingston who you can also bowl as well at six and then you have another all-rounder at seven and actually that then looks very deep and like any anyone can play uh, the way they want to. I think Phil made this point a couple of weeks ago but I think there is an argument that four, I know there isn't the the evidence for it but there is an argument that four could suit Stokes because mm. of the kind of player he is. I know he does have that brilliant record opening but he's not sort of a, a, a salt Roy Hales type opener who goes out from absolutely from ball one and takes on the bowling. He does like to get set and that actually could be pretty well suited to England if he's coming in at sort of just after the power play. He can sort of be, he can knock it around for a little bit and then he can really explode. I think that could possibly suit him. Mm. But then um, if, it, if you end up with him and Milan playing similar roles through their power play, I think England could find themselves 20, 30 short. That, that's true. I guess they'll need to be flexible as well, possibly. Yeah, if England, I guess if England lose too early and they're both in the power play, then they might well be like... And, and, and Milan has also started quite a lot quicker this that year. That is true, yeah. He's a, he's, a, he's a slightly different profile of player now than he was when there were there was the discrepancy between his overall record and between how people sort of felt about him, I suppose. Um, so so go to, to your 11, how would it differ from mine? So I think... I think Hales would just edge Salt for the moment, but I agree it'd be very close. And I think as much as I do like the batting depth in that 11, um, and I think that might be the 11 that they would pick if Morgan was in charge. I think he preferred the batting depth and Butler likes to have the bowling options, I think. I think I would still go with Topley or Wokes over Curran. And I think I would just lean to Chris Wokes at the moment, I think. So... So that's interesting. So basically, Stokes comes in at the expense of Sam Curran. I know they're not in the same mm. batting position. Yeah. And that's where I struggle. I just don't think Ben Stokes is a better T20 cricketer than Sam Curran. I, I, I think in terms mm. of someone coming in and hitting sixes from the off, Sam Curran is so much better than Stokes at that. Uh, I think I think Curran is actually quite a versatile batter as well. And I think he offers more with the ball in T20. Uh, you've got the left arm angle. And he's just done it more recently. He doesn't go for as many runs as Stokes. So... You know, Stokes the character, you can't, it's unavoidable that in a World Cup, he's the one who gets the job done. But I think in terms of who, where people actually stand as T20 cricketers at the moment, I think Curran's ahead of Stokes. Mm. Uh, I, I, definitely on the bowling, I think Sam Curran is a really underrated T20 bowler because you kind of look at him and you're like, what does he have? He's not expressed quick. And you kind of think of him as someone who swings a new ball and that David Willey style, but he doesn't actually do that that much. He isn't used with a new ball that much with England. He's just very clever. He'd, a lot of games where he just kind of quietly goes at one for 30, bowling not the nicest overs. He was in um, joint leading wicket taker this series, yeah. which is, is worth mentioning. Yeah, I think he probably is a bit ahead of Stokes as a as a bowler. And I, can't, I think I probably, I almost agree that overall he's a more valuable T20 player in a way than Stokes. But because England have... Moeen, I think you kind of only want it's it's all I think in a way once you if, if you are able to have a bowling option in the top six, it becomes Curran v Moeen versus if you have both of them, then I think you like Stokes will be more consistent than either of those two. And I think that's actually almost what England need in that top seven. I think the top seven is better balanced with them, even if if you were doing a straight forward auction, 
Curran might go for more money because you could almost build a side around his kind of his skill set, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's also worth adding that Livingston hasn't played cricket in a while. He got mm. injured during the 100. He'll be coming into the tournament cold. Um, I think he's going to be fit to play the warm-ups in Australia. It seems but to not be... Guaranteed. Not guaranteed. Not yeah. guaranteed, okay. So that's another... Th- you know, Livingston, I think, will definitely play a part in the World Cup, but you don't need to start the World Cup to finish it. So mm. there might be a bit of a bit of change as, as we go through. They've just got fantastic options. Yeah, I mean, uh, my team is Butler, Hales, Milan, Stokes. I'm, I'm happy with Stokes at four. I mean, it's essentially, out of the guys in the squad, I can't really see else who could do it with Duckett not in the squad. And I think Stokes against, I think he'll do well in Australia. Pitchers suit him. Um, so I'm happy with him there. Brook five, Moeen six. And then Curran at seven, if, Presuming Livingston's not 100% for the start of the tournament, Jordan, Wokes, Rashid, Wood, um, and then Livingston in for Curran when he's available. Yeah, just um, in terms of the other way they could do it, if people are wondering, I guess it would be probably Brook at four, and then you play both Hales and Salt, and Salt has done that sort of middle order finishing mm-hmm. role for England before, so he would be at five, or you have a sort of flexible middle order of Salt, Moeen, Livingston, Curran. So that, that is an option, but yeah, they've said Stokes at four, so I guess that's mm-hmm. what will happen. Um, ben, in the fifth T20, oh, there's a pretty cool debut for Pakistan's armour, Jamal. 26 years old, all-rounder. He's never played in the PSL before. And he's bowling against an informal Moeen Ali at the death. And he closes the game out. Yeah, and he hadn't even had a particularly good... Like, if, if he'd had an absolutely incredible national T20 Cup campaign beforehand, you could kind of understand it. But it wasn't that good. He was still going mm. at sort of like nearly 10 and over. So you're kind of wondering what have they seen in this guy who had only played, I think, 11 T20s in total. Before that, so it is. It's a proper Pakistan. We were looking at his record and we're like, we're not quite sure if he's a batter or bowler. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Uh, but he was absolutely brilliant that final over. He just uh, like absolutely nailed uh, those wide Yorkers. He had a plan. He stuck to it. There was one that he missed, and Moen got hold of it and hit him for six. And there was a wide after that. And I thought at that moment he might fall to pieces, which would have been perfectly understandable given the pressure. But then he really pulled it back, and yeah, Moen had nowhere to go really. Yeah, and then the next game he goes for, uh, I think. 12 in his, in his two overs and then is uh, is out of the side again uh, but still he'll always have that that one night in Lahore I guess mm. where do you think Pakistan are as a as, as a T20 side as, as contenders for the World Cup you've obviously got Shaheen Afridi to come back Shalab Khan didn't play that much this series but that, that middle order didn't fire at all the 3, 4 and 5 from the last World Cup aren't there anymore Harris Ralph was excellent but the other quicks really went the distance yeah I mean they are as we've kind of said they're he- he- heavily reliant on Baba and Rizwan, which is why those two bat that way. Ralph was brilliant. Shaheen should come back. And if they do, they will still threaten the best sides. Because if you have two bowlers who can bowl that quickly and take wickets up top and then bowl at the death, and you have two batters who are going to be able to get you to a total or basically chase down anything on their day, that is going to be a threat. But obviously, it's a hugely lopsided side. I think the, the two players they'll be most disappointed about not having kicked on are Hader Ali and Kushdal Shah. I mean, Hader Ali is, it was not far off the hype that was seen for a young Barbarazan when he was coming into the side. Um, but he just hasn't developed at all in the way you think he's regressed, if anything. There's some sort of suggestion that he's he's been limited by some sort of iffy advice. People saying that he should be playing more correctly, that he shouldn't throw his wicket away. And now he's trying to sort of be more orthodox, but not succeeding with that. So he's not scoring quickly or consistently. Um, but wh- whatever's happening, he's, he's hugely out of form. And he's obviously, he's a young guy who hasn't got the experience of bouncing back from that sort of loss of form as well. Um, so that's a real worry. And Kushal Shah, is, he was this massively clutch player in the PSL for quite a long time. And he's got a really good ODI record and has played a few really good knocks in ODI cricket. There was one really tight chase against West Indies, I think, where he hit three six and three balls, sort of turn a game that was drifting away from Pakistan their way. So there is some evidence, but he was really poor in this series and his record is poor overall. He quite often faces of quite a few, like 10 upwards balls and still scores quite slowly. He hasn't really done it against any international side of note in T20 cricket. Um, and he's in that sort of that linchpin position at sort of four or five, I guess now with Shah Massoud in the team. Um, and he's also just completely not firing. Um, Shah Massoud is another, is, is, is big and he, he, he bats as well, even if his two 50s came in games where Pakistan have kind of already lost it. Um, but if, if Pakistan just have a third quite consistent batter, that means that, Either it means that Baba and Rizwan can go a bit harder, or even if not, it means that if one of them gets out early, they can still sort of put up some sort of total. I mean, Baba and Rizwan did go harder this series as well. That's true, yeah. Yeah, and they, they, they looked more attacking as a team. It sometimes didn't translate into the run rate as well. Um, uh, 
so yeah i mean that they're, they're a weird side and they are probably a weaker side than last year but it's also a, a weird format and a weird sport so they, they could well still go the whole way in terms of their world cup prospects they're in a group with uh india bangladesh south africa and two sides to come most likely west indies um will be one of those sides and you'd think you know india it, it, it is a lottery with these tournaments, but you'd think India would probably top that group. And then I think there's really not much to choose between Pakistan and South Africa. Uh, so, you know, that could be, if they lose to South Africa, lose to India, then that's their tournament done, possibly. Mm. Uh, equally, if they got through to the semi-finals, I could absolutely see them going on to win it. So mm. I think they seem probably in slightly better shape than they did ahead of the last tournament. And then as soon as the tournament started, we were like, God, this is a, a brilliant side and then all it took was Matthew Wade going berserk and then they're out of the tournament so who knows I yeah. guess is my point and they haven't <laughs> obviously Shaheen should be back for the World Cup uh, yeah. was a big loss against England and Nassim Shah as well potentially yeah. he only played one game and then, then was ill um, moving on let's get to that county championship finale I mean we're going to talk about our moments of the summer at the end of the show and I, I was really trying to think it, am I am I just being extremely biased to what I've just seen but that that last day was definitely up there for in my moments of summer a crazy final round at the bottom of division one so Yorkshire lost to already relegated Gloucestershire by 18 runs in three days to leave Warwickshire needing to beat Hampshire on the final day that game shouldn't have been anywhere near a result given the rain that came down in the first few days so Warwickshire declared on 270 for four in their first innings to just move the game forward Warwickshire started day four, 62 for two in the game's third innings, leading by just 20. They were bowled out for 177 in search of quick runs, leaving Hampshire most of the day to chase down 139. Uh, If Hampshire won that, they'd have relegated Warwickshire. Then what followed was incredible. Liam Norwell playing just his fourth county championship game of the season took nine for 62. He pretty much bowled the whole innings in tandem with Oliver hannon Dorby, who Barely bowled a bad ball himself at the other end. Norwell traps Abbas LBW to give Warwickshire the win by five runs to relegate Yorkshire. Um, a just totally bonkers finish. And then the, the main man was a bowler who's just had a really, really difficult summer. It was one of the great spells in county history. I know that sounds overblown because, you know, recency bias and all that, but it just, it just absolutely was, given what was at stake given his backstory, the struggles he's had this year with with injury and his baby boy being sick. Um, and it was just relentless. He, he said afterwards, that he'd, he said to Will Rhodes, uh, the Warwickshire captain, after he got out Barker, I think, with that being the seventh wicket, he said, can I come off for a breather? But at that point, there were so few runs left to win that Rhodes, he said, he couldn't repeat the words that were used, but he said, you, you crack on, you're, you're bowling till the end here. Uh, and it looked like he was absolutely spent, but he just he just kept coming and kept coming. And it was one of those lovely examples of, of um, how much county cricket has been enhanced by the live streams over the last few years that suddenly everyone was aware that this game that looked like it was heading to Hampshire for quite a while suddenly explodes into life uh, and everyone goes over to the stream and suddenly you don't just hear about a county spell. A lot of us actually had the pleasure of watching it unfold mm. and it was, yeah, wonderful, wonderful drama. Yorkshire, wow. I mean, what what a season to have unbeaten after six games. Mm-hmm. Uh, their record without Harry Brooks this year is horrendous. Um, it had been coming. Uh, they hadn't won a game since the opening round, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Haven't won a game at Headingley all summer. And then all they needed to do was get something out of their last few games, which were all pretty well, bar Surrey, were, were winnable games. And then to lose at home in front of your home fans to Gloucestershire, who were relegated three weeks before, pretty bleak stuff. But it had been coming. Uh, there was the Steve Patterson relega- um, res- resignation as captain a few weeks out. Odd timing must have been unsettling for the squad you've got David Willey saying he's off to North Ants halfway through the season saying that the club are more con- concerned about their reputation than they are than the current players it, it is in a very divisive summer for the English game Yorkshire has been the sort of epicenter of that of that divide and you know Otis Gibson said before Yorkshire got relegated but after they knew that Warwickshire might be able to relegate them said if we if we go down there's not we can't blame anyone but ourselves well Yorkshire fans might disagree with that and there'll be a lot of Yorkshire fans who are very upset about the way the season's gone and feel hard done by here um and the story just runs on and on mm. Sham Masood arriving as new captain for a division two Yorkshire side for the first time in what a decade and it's possible that they, they they won't be able to go 
We don't know exactly what the county structure will look like in 2024, but it's possible that they can't actually get promoted to the top division next summer. Yeah, I don't think Yorkshire will be voting for that one. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah some counties might. Yeah. Um, yeah, just go, going going on, on Yorkshire, it's been, as you say, a horrible year for the county off the pitch, but also on it. Theoretically, they could have fielded a middle order of balance, Milan, Root, Brook and Bairstow. For different reasons, none of them were there. Um we said it during the game against Surrey at the Oval that that was a very, very weak three to six. And out of those guys, I guess Root's absence sticks out the most because he was playing golf. <laughs> and Adil Rashid got a lot of stick in 2016 for not playing the final game in the summer where they could have won the championship. But Joe Root, England captain, you know, like golden boy of Yorkshire, he wasn't there. Officially, it's the ECB who pulled him out. But the understanding is that the ECB kind of reflect the player's desire. And it's, we have like an increasingly weird dynamic with the top, top England players in counties. Biggest game of the season for Yorkshire. And the England England's best batsman of the last 30 years isn't there. What, what do, you, do you understand why Root doesn't play those games? Or Yeah, it's a really tricky one, especially because... England don't play another test until December either. So if he played this round, he would still have got a lot of rest before that time. You know, based on Johnny Bairstow, there's no guarantee that you're going to get out of a round of golf unscathed either. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's, 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 a very, it's a very ugly optics as much as anything. Um, and I can, if I was a Yorkshire fan, I would be pretty fuming, I think. Um, yeah and I mean I, you know we do have to take into account that you know Root did have a, a very good summer he works very hard I think his commitment to, to England is is in doubt and I'm I, I guess in a way he probably didn't think too much of it he was asked he was probably thinking a bit more of personal do, do you fancy playing in this game of cricket or not he had uh an offer on the table to go and play what was probably quite a lucrative round of golf as well uh went and did that and 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 that, and that was his choice and then all of a sudden Yorkshire relegated and he's kind of the, the poster boy of it in a way. Yeah, personally, I think it stinks, really. Uh, you know, I've got a huge amount of respect for Joe Root and what he's done across his career, particularly over the last couple of years. Uh, but I th- yeah, this was a, a bad call on mm. his part. And you just have to wonder, he's always played for Yorkshire when he's sort of, when he's felt like he could and there's been gaps in order to do so. And the fact that he chose not to this time obviously this was an attractive golfing proposition I understand if you love golf which I don't but that would be a lovely <laughs> day out <laughs> but would he have rejected that opportunity a couple of years ago or, or is this symptomatic of how th- how rotten things have got at Yorkshire that, that actually that wasn't near the top of his priority list mm. at that point yeah I think it's it's bad um, and David Hopps wrote an excellent piece for Crick Info talking not just about Root, but how it's kind of symptomatic of kind of county cricket's standing in the in the kind of grand scheme of things, particularly in relation to England cricketers. And it's hard to disagree with any of that as well. It's, yeah, really, really unfortunate, badly judged call, I think. And one that, not that it is his responsibility, because a lot of things have gone wrong at Yorkshire, but it, it might well have relegated them mm. in the end. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a weird one. We were, we were talking yesterday about how the, the big name England players who play lots of formats, who play most of the year round, they've been calling for a long time of how they want to play less and less cricket. And <laughs> they are playing less cricket during the English summer. You know, the big name England players, how much cricket have they really played in England since the start of August? Ben Stokes, we're talking about it in relation to his him not playing much T20 cricket in the build-up to the T20 World Cup. But he's played what, three games of cricket in the last seven eight weeks um understandable reasons you were making the point yesterday that if you actually go through every individual series that he's missed it is he's made it very understandable that he's missed them but the bigger picture is you've got the star names of english cricket not actually playing that much the english summer is more than just the test summer and we, we haven't seen that much of them and in a gap of the schedule it's not as if there's a looming test series where these guys are expected to play. That there's a really good opportunity for him to play. Then, mm. um, can we say a bit more about Liam Norwell, if that's all right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because because uh, obviously it was it was an amazing performance, but it wasn't as much as it was a career high for him. It wasn't totally unexpected. I think if if he'd been available all season, there's no way that Warwickshire are in this yeah. this trouble. Uh, he was brilliant last year in their uh, county championship win. He went on that that Lions tour along with the Ashes and bowled well there, didn't he? 
Mm. So I think, and he was quite sort of uh, uh, phlegmatic when speaking after play, it seemed like about his England opportunities, I guess, you know, life has sort of got in the way. It's probably given him a bit of perspective. He is now 30 young guys have come through, but I would not be at all surprised if he finds himself in an England test squad, even making an appearance when England are resting or rotating or there's a few injuries and that sort of thing, because he looks like he's kind of, you know, he's, he's, he's not expressed quick, but he looks like he's, he's quick enough and that he's always at you and that he's willing to absolutely put everything on the line. And it looks like there's kind of all the ingredients there for it. Mm. I, I agree. I was, you know, maybe it's just being modest, but at the end when he said, I think my chance is gone. I, yeah, I don't see it that way at all. Uh, I think he could easily get a chance. What he does doesn't look hugely similar to some of what Matt Potts does mm. with the ball as well. And that's shown that it can be really successful. Obviously, there's almost 10 years between them, but 30 is is not an age for it, no age for a seamer, really. Uh, I mean, you know, look at Anderson and Broad, they're still doing all right. Um, yeah, and I, I wonder even, I mean, when he can bowl again, I mean, he's probably exhausted. I mean, he's yeah. a couple of months out to recover, <laughs> but you know, he looks like he might even be a decent option as a squad bowler in, in Pakistan, potentially. Mm. Um, if you're looking for a seamer who can get through a lot of overs mm. and keep it relatively tight and, and just bowl stump to stump, then I think he might be a decent option. I mean, he's three years younger than Scott Boland. Um, and I was looking at his first class record today. Since the start of 2017, summer, that's a long time ago. He's taken 158 first class wickets at 18. So that's a serious record over, over a really long period of time. Um, ben, yesterday you brought up a, an old piece on the, on the 10 best county championship finishes. Uh, and at the top of that list is obviously the Toby Roland Jones hat trick to win it in 2016 but what what are some of the others that, that stuck out well i reckon joe might have written this piece possibly i was just it was starting to ring a bell i think <laughs> i did write this yeah. or some of it um uh the, the 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 other one from recent well there's two actually there's two others from recent history but the one that really stuck out was the vbs latchman one when lancashire were chasing something like 489 uh to win the title on the final day and uh, he makes a, a sublime century, all of the centuries are sublime, obviously. Uh, and they end up losing by about 20 runs. Uh, that's obviously incredible. There, there were some other more fun ones. There was one in the, uh, in the late 80s, I think, where it was Worcestershire up against, I forget who I should have written it down, but um, Worcestershire basically needed to force a win. Um, and there was some, uh, some unhappiness with their title rivals over a lost bonus point earlier in the season. <laughs> where they had uh, got a side eight down, but they had had two injured batters. They couldn't get that final bat bowling bonus point. And they were went into it and then ended up losing the title by a point. But um, going into that final day, someone, presumably you'd think a fan of the rivals, had uh, got into the pitch and poured engine oil all over it. So it was sort of a frantic mop mopping up operation. <laughs> uh, and then just enough time to force victory. So that was another pretty good one in, uh, in the late 80s. Do you remember any of them if you, if you wrote yeah, the piece? Yeah, it's, it's all ringing a bell. Yeah, <laughs> from quite a few years ago though, right? I reckon. Uh, yeah, I imagine so. Yeah. yeah. Um, some big news on the T20 World Cup. Jasprit Bumrah has been ruled out for India. Shimran Hatbai will miss the tournament for the West Indies after not being able to make his flight to Australia. Uh, I'm not quite, I'm not sure it's quite as straightforward as saying that he just turned up late to the flight and therefore missed it. The West Indies director of cricket, Jimmy Adams, said, we changed Shimron's flight from Saturday to Monday due to family reasons. It was made clear to him that if there were any further delays and issues with his travel to Australia, then we would have had no choice but to replace him in the squad as we are not prepared to compromise the team's ability to prepare for this extremely important global event. Hetmai informed Adams that he would not be able to get to the airport in time for his flight later that day. Um... Obviously, that's a big blow for West Indies, who are already short of several star names. Um, yeah, how they've ended up with a squad without Russell, Hetmeyer and Narain, who are all, in theory, available, is, mm. is pretty bizarre. It's very hard to know what to make of the Hetmeyer thing mm. because you don't want to dive in. We don't know what the family reasons are. We don't know if there was issues in the lead up to this. You never quite know with the West Indies board and selectors, whether they're kind of flying off the handle unnecessarily. So I wouldn't want to kind of pass judgment, but... He is a huge loss. I mean, him and Puran would have been the, the kind of middle order players mm. who held the whole thing together and they've lost a lot of experience. It's, I, I think I think they might go even worse than they did at the last World Cup, actually. Mm. Um, but in India are going pretty well at the moment. I think they should they should be still one of the two favourites, even without Bumrah. Yeah, I mean, that is a a massive loss and there's, there's not really a way to replace him. It looks like Mohamed Shami is going to come in who doesn't have a a hugely compelling recent T20 or T20I record. Um, I think actually 
weirdly, India fans are almost a bit relieved in a way that he's missing the tournament um, because there was a worry. I think they were worried that what they, what some feel has happened to Bhavneshwar Kumar would happen to Bumra, where he was sort of one of India's best bowlers for, for quite a long time, but was then injured and then came back too quickly and then injured again and then came back too quickly and then injured again and sort of ended up coming back sort of like a shadow of his former self who wasn't able to keep up fitness at all. And with the way that sort of it initially came out that it was leaks that he would miss the 21 Cup and it's like, oh no, we hope he'll be fit. And Ganguly saying like, yeah, it might not be too bad. And that's just doesn't seem like what you kind of want to do with these stress injuries to the back. That I think some India fans and pundits, etc., are worried that Bumrah would be kind of force his way, forces himself to play the World Cup, end up injuring himself even worse. And you've kind of then lost this kind of mercurial kind of superstar. Mm. So in some ways, actually, there are there's some India fans that are relieved that that hasn't happened, but it's still a massive blow for this tournament. But yeah, I think that the main thing that, and we talked about it before, but they just absolutely have nailed their batting approach, basically. And it looks like Kara Hall, who was the one question mark over his sort of buy into it, like he's really clocked on as well. He made a very quick half century in a really high scoring game uh, against South Africa. Um, and obviously, Sirik Yadav is probably the best T20 batter in the world at the moment. You've got Kohli in there, who's rediscovered a bit of form. You've got Rohit, who's sort of going as hard as he ever has done. You've got Hardik Pandya, who might be the best T20 rounder in the world, possibly. You've got Dinesh Kartik, who has absolutely embraced this finisher role and is kind of doing it pretty much every time. They've kind of got all the boxes ticked from a batting front. And then the bowling is still good, pretty good. And capable, even without uh, the best or second best T20 bowl in the world. But yeah, it's massive for the T20 Cup as well to be missing Archer and Bumrah. And Shaheen is still a doubt, but looks like he'll make it. That's You're either missing two the two best T20 fast bowls in the world or the, the top three. Uh, and for the tournament as a spectacle, it is a shame, but it sounds like it is still the best resolution and it could have been worse in a way. Mm. So we had... Um... We asked Crickviz to do a list, their list of the 20 best T20 players in the world for the upcoming magazine as a sort of way of previewing the tournament. And in the end, six of that 20 aren't playing because you've got Bairstow in there, Archer, Bumrah, and then the three West Indians, which is quite a, quite a big chunk, actually. Obviously, mm. for, all for different reasons or varying reasons. Um, and it is a bit of a shame. And hopefully, fingers crossed for a 3D, that, that looks more promising. Hopefully, mm. he'll be there. Yeah, absolutely. And should we talk about South Africa just a little bit as well? Uh, because they just have a, 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 a funny old issue with, with, with Bavuma, basically, who we mentioned before, having not been picked up in that SA20 auction. Um, and he had an absolute shocker in that, in that really high scoring game against India, where they were chasing, what, 238. Uh, and he plays out a maiden first up, which is uh, not ideal, including two proper lever loans as well, and then gets out for naught of seven. And then David Miller, who we'll talk about a bit more in a second, blitzes this absolutely unbelievable 100 and they lose by uh, by 16 runs. So this is a game where people are scoring at two runs a ball across the whole game. And then you have one batter who's faced not of seven. That's kind of, you know, the average batter in that game is scoring 14 runs with those balls. And all of a sudden it's a it's a real thriller. Um, and that's kind of been, like, Bavuma's record is just, it's just very poor in international cricket for quite a long period of time. Um, and it, I guess remains to be seen whether the rest can sort of make up for it. But Miller has been like astonishing in White Booker. I hadn't realised quite how good he had a brilliant IPL campaign after having had like six poor seasons, I think. Uh, and this season in T20Is, he's averaging over 50 and striking about 180. Uh, he's absolutely ridiculous. And he's kind of, I think it seems like his game against spin has really come on. That he used to like not get out to it too often, but be scoring quite slowly. Whereas now he's scoring quickly and consistently against that. And he's still just as good against pace as he always was. He's kind of the complete batter now. Uh, and he's also kind of the main man in that side too. Mm. And so he'll be one to really watch out for at the World Cup, I suppose. Mm. Right, time for our moment of the summer. So I've asked Ben and Joe to share with us their moment, player and match of the summer. I've also got loads of emails in from listeners um, describing what their moments of the summer are. So let's start with Joe, uh, your moment, player and match of the summer. All of them. Well, and it, not at the same time. <laughs> okay, um, I'll start with my moment because that was right at the start of the summer. Yep. Um, the first morning of the Lord's Test, uh, the start of the Red Bull Revolution. Um, still feeling pretty bruised from the ashes. Anderson hadn't looked great in early season. Had he lost his nip? Is the captaincy going to be too much for Stokes? On top of everything else that he had on his plate. Uh, and then, you know, within a couple of overs, it was like, oh, maybe 
everything will be all right after all. Uh, by the end of the day, it looked like it definitely wouldn't be. And then by the end of the match, it looked like it would be. So that, that kind of sums up the, the test mm. summer. But Kiwis 39 for six at lunch. You know, the first morning of a Lord's test is always mm. exciting anyway, but this was kind of box office stuff really. Kiwis not batting particularly well, it should be said, but Anderson bowling beautifully, getting both openers. And then it's uh, Matt Potts arrives, takes three for nothing, getting Williamson. Um, and so there's a real excitement around the place, some kind of ludicrous field settings that we would become used to over the course of the summer. Um, and yeah, the start of something, as it's turned out to be, quite quite special. We probably didn't get the, the Baz ball, in inverted commas, until the next test. England didn't score lightning speeds at Lords, but although they did bat very well to win the game in, in the fourth innings. Um, and as an aside, I remember thinking on that first morning, God, New Zealand can't compete with... Daryl Mitchell at five and Tom Blundell <laughs> at six. And as it turns out, they were two of the absolute players of the summer and yeah. the rest of the Kiwis struggled. Yeah, it's almost easy to forget just how much the mood changed around the test team to, from the start to the end of the summer. It just By the end of it, it was just normalised that England would play this really exciting brand of cricket and probably win. But at the start of the summer, it was so bleak. I mean, everyone talks about the one win in 17, but there were so many question marks going through that 11. Well, and particularly on that first morning, it felt so... Uh, to see Anderson and Broad bowl as well as they did because a lot of us were saying, you know, they're, they're one bad test match away mm. from not playing. It's easy to forget now, but obviously they didn't go to the Caribbean and it looked like that might be the end. This almost felt like a reprieve rather than a continuation. Um, and very quickly, it was clear that, you know, in these conditions, you've got to play them. I mean, yeah. I, I think we probably knew that in advance, but, but they were still on it. Mm. Um, how about your match of the summer? My match, quite predictable. Um, it's got to be Trent Bridge, the New Zealand test. Mm. Um, that fantastic chase on the final day, all, all over in the blink of an eye. And importantly, again, for the rest of the summer, that Trent Bridge or Nottinghamshire deserve a lot of credit for opening up their, their doors, free tickets on the final day, which by the end of the summer became the norm and what everyone was doing. But it was not who, who did that in the first place and just massively added to the atmosphere in terms of getting more people in, but also getting a different crowd in, quite a lot of students there on that on that final day. Um, yeah, in a day, I think anyone who was there or even just watched it on telly probably won't ever forget. Mm. Um, how about your player of the summer? My player, I just as I did this, I just got more and more on my list. So I'll try, I'll try and <laughs> race through him. So Will Jacks was brilliant in all formats. PCA Player of the Year. His ton against Essex, I think, was probably the Championship Knock of the Year. Potts, aforementioned, 78 first-class wickets in 15 matches this summer. I mean, that is staggering really 58 in the championship 20 test wickets there's a lot to like about him john simpson brilliant year at middlesex a thousand runs for the first time in his long career kept like a dream as ever and scored really important runs at crucial times to to get middlesex finally back in the top tier but the one i've gone for is uh wayne madsen he'll be 39 in january but he finished as the leading run scorer in the county championship passed 50 and 13 of his 24 innings uh three tons in there also made the first T20 hundred of his career, at age 38. Uh, was excellent in the blast throughout, and he's just. I wanted to pick him out because I think he's just a phenomenal player who doesn't really get the credit he deserves. I noticed he wasn't in Wisdom.com's Championship Team of the Year, which we got an angry email about. And mm. actually, even though I've picked him here, he wasn't in the WCM Championship Team of the Year either because there were so many middle order options. Mm. And Madsen's runs came in a mid-table Div Two side on what was a very good pitch at Derby, and the other options kind of felt more compelling but in terms of his what he's produced for county cricket over the what 15 years he's been part of it uh he's stunningly good and we've mentioned it a couple of times on the podcast but he might not get the credit he deserves uh amongst kind of fans and on twitter and all that kind of stuff but in terms of his peers he is hugely respected when the players fill in their survey for the cricket to sue at the start of the summer and get asked who their who the best player in county cricket is wayne madsen won last year hands down and yeah this is a guy towards the end of his career so mm. you know a real special talent and um someone that has really blessed county cricket even if he hasn't necessarily always got the credit he deserves mm. and th- th- you were talking about his consistency earlier just like he-, he passed 50 like pretty much once every two innings yeah so 13 20 in 24 innings so yeah more than half his knocks he passed 50 mm. that's, a, that's a good pick hopefully we don't get any email complaints about that pick um ben what about you? Start with your moment in the summer. So my moment in the summer is from that third New Zealand test, which is the uh, the one I was at in full at Headingley. I've been at two Headingley tests in full, which is uh, this one and the 2019 Ashes test. So I've, I've <laughs> p- picked some good ones. 
Uh, but it was day, day two, which I think was just about the most ridiculous day of the whole summer. It's a, it's a crowded field, but I think it was. And I guess if I had to pick one moment, it'll be Ben Stokes hitting his third ball for six. But that whole day was ridiculous. You had When the, England were... Uh, was it 13 for three, I think, and on their way to being 55 for six? Uh, there were lo- lo- so many great things about that day. So you had Leach taking five for in the morning or finishing his five for in the morning. It's not even a footnote by the end of the day because the footnote is Trent Bolt, who's taken three wickets, all clean bowled with a new ball and still ends up conceding like 40 runs from his opening spell. Uh, so then Stokes comes out and hits, hits that third ball for six. Just as England cricket tweet uh, the quote from uh, Stokes from before the test, which is like, I think our job is to entertain. That's when Stokes gets out and that tweet is swiftly, swiftly deleted. <laughs> which is quite amusing. Um, uh, England are six down and you kind of think, okay, this surely there's no way out of this one. Like New Zealand have made, you know, 300 and a little bit. England are 55 for six. Uh, it's a guy on debut in there. Sure, Johnny Bairstow's there, but this is like, th- this is the time when it kind of comes a cropper and it, and, it, and it doesn't. Like Bairstow raises to 150. Overton gets out just inside of that 100. Um, England end up with, uh, a lead which is their, their their second biggest lead of the summer i think in the end or maybe their third biggest um and uh and and and, and that's the game one but yeah that that was my uh, my day of the summer in the moment would be that that one stoke six which is kind of encapsulated kind of everything about uh how england are approaching but, it, I guess. But, but that day that partnership between over and besto it kind of felt inevitable at one point they would just keep going. I know, I know at the very start it didn't, but once they once they scored fifty runs in no time, you're like, what's going to stop them? And you had Jamie Overton on Test debut. Yeah, that's true. It, 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 hasn't, fe- it hasn't played since. Yeah, it hasn't played since. Averages ninety seven in Test cricket. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it it was a really weird combination of that of of feeling kind of uh, like you had to kind of wrap your head around how bad England's position was because the mood was kind of, because they kept attacking basically. Because that that because that was what they were doing, you kind of felt like, oh, okay, they're in a position where they feel they can attack. So it must not be too bad. It was a bit like at the end of the second day of the India Test as well, when England were, I think, four down. India had made absolutely loads, and you're like, oh, actually, England have England have been absolutely awful so far in this game, and they're really far behind in it. They're probably going to lose, and then obviously they didn't. But actually, even realizing that they were far behind took some thinking to do, even though if it was any other sort of team at any other point in time but like, mm. okay yeah they uh this 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 game is done mm. that sort of thing and yeah i mean we haven't really talked about best yet he's, he's almost it's too obvious to pick out as the player of the summer but he was totally ridiculous in that first that those four tests of the summer particularly the last two against new zealand and then the the, the india test match he was just a, on a completely different level yeah and each hundred is almost so good that it like detracts from the others i think if you spread those out across like a career. Uh, yeah, across a career or across <laughs> 10 tests or something. Or just just a little bit longer than you have each as like a sort of monument to a player's greatness. You know, you have uh, England's second fastest ton in a massive, in a really big chase um, on the final day. Uh, like, incredible. You have rescuing them from 55 to 6 um, to, you know, to, to get them into a first things lead when the position set more than 300. You have incredible. You have a really quick ton in England's highest ever test chase. But because they're all one after the other, they almost feel like they bleed into one. Uh, and like, obviously, it's an absolutely ridiculous run of four. I'm not taking, I'm, I want to give Besto more credit almost than he's already got, which is a lot. Uh, that, that it, and there was a bit of sort of like uh, tutting about people sort of reveling in this run of form, about comparing it to, uh, you know, other great players. But as, as a run of form, as a, as a run of three hundreds and three games, I think you'd struggle to find a better one across all of, Especially, maybe Lara would have you, you point to his series in in Sri Lanka or uh, that series against Australia in '99. But in terms of a, a very concentrated run of incredible form, there's there's almost no matching it. I think. I agree. I think he almost hasn't got enough credit as well. But partly because it's got so wrapped up in the New England baseball stuff, mm. it's almost like a lot of the credit that is deserved for Besto has gone to McCullum and yeah. Stokes <laughs> because they said go and give it a hit. Whereas yeah. actually, like. You know, obviously they have liberated him and, and deserve credit for that, and clearly that has had a big impact on the way he plays. But, but he's gone out there and done that by himself repeatedly against some really good attacks as well. Some really good attacks. Yeah, I mean, on 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 what you were saying about how how it compares to previous runs of form, specifically in terms of what we've seen in previous English summers, no one has scored more than four hundreds in an English summer before, and best they did that in three Test matches. Um, absolutely, right up there. Um, how about your player of the summer yeah so like joe i had 
quite a few candidates. I'll try and not mention anyone that he said. Uh, ben Folks was up there, averaging a lot in that Surrey win. And he actually featured in my match of the sun, which we'll come on to. Uh, and obviously that, that first home test 100 was a, a, a special moment, which I was uh, lucky to be there for again. Um, so he, he was up there. Laura Mayfield Hill was up there, uh, just runs whenever she batted and finally knocking the Southern Vipers off their perch at Lords as well, which was good. Uh, Oliver Hannon Dolby was up there for me in that um, obviously if Norwell had played uh, a lot of the season, Warwickshire wouldn't have been that in trouble. But if Hannon Dolby hadn't been there, um, they would have been completely stuffed. And I think it was it was interesting with the the batch of Duke's balls, you kind of got, it was a bit of a, a filter between different types of bowlers. And if you could have picked out someone, I think, before the season, you could have said would have maybe struggled if there wasn't that C movement on offer. Uh, you'd have looked at him because he's got this kind of quite a bit of an awkward action. There's no great pace there. It does seem like at times it can. he's relying on that assistance and that just wasn't the case. He was yeah, an absolutely brilliant record when some of other Warwickshire's bowlers uh, didn't. Um, but I ended up settling for Sam Cook and not just because I uh, had a nice chat with him just now, <laughs> but because he uh, because he, he remains sort of peerless in the English game, basically. Um there was a stat that Essex put up when he got to his 200th first class wicket and he was averaging under 20. And he was the first English bowler to do that in first class cricket since 1980, which shows the kind of uh, the level he's operating at. Um, and he again had a really, really good early season record, ended up with 50 wickets at about 16. I don't think anyone else with more than 15 wickets, I think, best of that average. And he was there as one of the leading wicket takers in the country. I think his economy was the best in the division, yeah. As well, I mean, so he just he just does it all, and 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 a and a brilliant white ball summer as well, and and then ended up uh, playing a, a key part in the hundred as well. So, um, yeah, he's uh, just a a, a a phenomenal bowler who is kind of do almost doing what the rest are doing, but just at a level higher than they are. If that makes sense, mm. we get. I think we're getting to the point with him now that we got to with Ollie Robinson last summer and probably Craig Overton before that, where their county records, even though you might say they don't necessarily have all the assets that you want in a test bowler, their county records are so good that you've got to give them a go and, and see. And obviously with Robinson, uh, it's worked out famously on the, on the field anyway, um, in terms of that uh, he just looks like a test bowler. And obviously he does have different attributes to Cook. He's taller, he gets more bounce. But I think there's nothing to say that Cook couldn't, work in test cricket in the right conditions i don't think we're expecting him to kind of tear it up in the subcontinent or or in australia but um i think he i think he at least deserves a crack yeah uh, because otherwise you go three four years down the line he's just going to keep doing this in county mm. cricket and wh when do you give him his chance and it's got to be sooner rather than later yeah definitely i mean we, we were talking earlier that uh england have this very strange odi series in australia just after the t20 world cup just before the test series in pakistan I can Which see. I had absolutely no idea about until you <laughs> told me. I well, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure why it's being played, so I don't blame you. But I can imagine Cook making his debut in that series. Um, not sure that's the best place for it, but sure, true, an ODI true. series in Australia yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. sound like the way to go. But he <laughs> is a very good white true. ball bowler as well. Yeah. Um, ben, what about your match of the summer? So this was uh, Yorkshire's match against Surrey. I'll just remind people how it went because it might be one that uh, has sort of fallen from the memory. But Yorkshire made uh, 521 in the first innings. And managed to lose the game. Um, Sorry, made 515, scoring it basically four and over exactly. Um, and then bowled Yorkshire up 220. So not 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 a skittling, but left them with just enough time to chase uh, 227 at uh, over five and over. So it was kind of, it, I think, kind of summed up quite a lot of things. It summed up where Yorkshire are at to lose a game from such a a dominant position in the first innings was sort of telling about. Um, uh, you know where they're at as a side and it also showed kind of what has made Surrey such worthy champions I guess which is how they managed to identify uh, what was needed in those kind of early season conditions when the pitches were flat and you kind of had to find other ways to win because they went hard from very early on they kind of even when that five on shows was made they didn't see victory as being beyond them at all they uh, that so deep, don't they? Exactly. They have, they have that license, yeah. And that, that was evident in that game as well. I mean, you had Dan Royal at number 11 hitting a, a very quick 26 to take him from sort of being 70 runs behind to being almost on par in the first innings. And then also you had Folks, who was one of the players of the summer, making an unbeaten 86 in that first innings and then uh, a 42 at best than a runner ball to see the chase home with just enough time to spare. Um, and again, in that you had, you know, all of the top five making 
sort of between 20 and 30 it was a proper sort of team effort and one that sort of very candidly understood what was needed for county cricket county championship cricket at that point in time i guess hmm. um i'll go so my so players of the summer um i am going pots um i think just the way he lit up i think similar to what ben said about hannon dolby the bowlers who did well in that first chunk of the season in particular um bowling averages went down in the august well the, the september leg of the championship but in that start of the season so few seam bowlers were doing well anyone who did really stood out and the kind of the way he got his wickets as well really stood out um, he's getting good players out getting them bowled etc and then for him to do well uh straight away in test cricket having not really been anywhere near the team it wasn't really talked about he wasn't in line squads or anything like that so i thought the way he stepped up and kind of seamlessly um yeah, se- seamlessly went into that England team and did really well. I think he- he's my player of the summer. On, just on that theme of seamers and those who prospered in difficult conditions, I think mm. Toby Rowland Jones deserves Definitely. some credit this Definitely. year as well. The leading run scorer in the championship, sorry, leading wicket taker in the championship by I think about ten wickets in the mm. end, um, and took them consistently across the season. So he took a lot early season when others were struggling. Um, and as obviously that's him and Simpson have been the big reasons behind Middlesex getting promoted. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, moments this season, I mean, you mentioned the big ones from the England men's test summer. Um, one that stood out for me was from the from the women's test at Taunton. And I talked about it at the time, but uh, that, that test, it was almost unsettling how like, kind of good the cricket was throughout. You had the amazing cap 100, um, you had the Davidson Rich 100, Sivis scoring 100. Um, but you, it was played in the middle of the week at Taunton when the weather wasn't great. So you didn't have many fans in. Um, but my favourite bit of the Test match was Izzy Wong bowling under the lights um, where England in desperate need of getting some quick wickets. I think it was on the third evening. That that was really, really cool. Um, but my moment of the summer is, uh, we've talked about it on the pod before um, a little bit. Tar did a piece on the South Asian Cricket Academy. But for me, it was... Kashif Ali, who's part of that academy, scoring 100 on his list day debut and scoring a 50 on his county championship debut. Um, there's been so much about racism in the English and Scottish game. And I guess one part of that that I've always wanted to be central to those conversations, how do we actually move forward? And one of the things that was identified in Rafiq's testimony was how uh, players from South Asian backgrounds aren't getting the chances that they deserve. And this kind of... Uh, the, the South Asian Cricket Academy is probably paper-overing cracks in the system um, that shouldn't really be there, but it's ensured that some talented players who previously weren't getting opportunities have got opportunities. So he's not the only one, but Andy Omid got a contract with Somerset as well. Um, I was picking something out from Taha's piece on it, saying that the the academy views itself as an intervention programme that doesn't want to exist for more than three to six years, hoping that structural changes in the English game will make it redundant. But I think whilst the structural problems still remain, I think it's amazing that something's come in and so quickly after the um, racism scandal hit the front pages, I guess, last year, something positive to come out of it was just a really good story in the summer. Um, yeah, if listeners haven't read Taha's piece, which is on the website and also appeared in Wisdom Cricket Monthly, definitely go and read it. The, the, the context of where this thing's coming from and what it's actually doing is, is really, uh, really fascinating. Mm. And uh, he's done a great job on it. Um, and also just a, a, a shout out, I guess, for the, the Matt Parkinson test debut. That seems like a long time ago, but that oh, was, doesn't it? That was, um, pod favorite Matt Parkinson getting his test debut was, was awesome. And especially how he got it as well, driving down from Bolton, um, uh, you know, that, that glorious on drive, uh, his first thing he did in test cricket. That was really, really cool. Um, before we hear, uh, from listeners on their moments of summer, let's head to Mark Butcher to hear. What he enjoyed most from the summer that just gone. Mark, you were at most of the cricket that happened this summer, especially when England were playing. Um, so you're as qualified a man as any to pick your moment player in matches of the summer. So let's start with your moment of the summer. Um, well, I mean, many sort of eye-opening and, and jaw-dropping moments over the course of the summer, particularly in, in Test cricket. But I think maybe the one that epitomises everything um, was uh, was Joe Root reverse sweeping Tim Southey for six um, during that? Well, England had conceded what well over five hundred in the first innings, and then uh, on the third morning, I think Joe Root comes out and reverses him straight into the pavilion for six. Three slips, gully, 
um, tense moment in the match. Uh, and it was just astonishing. Um, he, of all the players to do something like that in the Indian team, he's probably the last one you'd expect. And it just kind of epitomised this absolute joyfulness with which England were playing Test match cricket. Um, and the longer the summer went on, you know, the, the more the more moments like that would occur and the more anything seemed to be possible. So I think that was, there was that moment where you just thought, well, these guys just do not care. They've, <laughs> they've absolutely, they've thrown all um, tradition and all caution out of the window. And, uh, and, and so that was it. Yeah, I, I know that was in the first innings, but I think he did the other two he, he did in run chases. And it almost became like his... Like doing keep keepy up is in the corner, like when you won a game, just to kind of show off, like I'm just having a good time. Um, ole, yeah. ole. Yeah, yeah. Um, moving on to your your match of the summer. Uh, match of the summer had to be the India at uh, Edgebaston. Um, it started off in great style with uh, with Boomer sledging me at the uh, at the, at the toss. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then, you know, proceeded to to be utterly ridiculous from from first ball to the last. Um, Pants brilliant hundred, Boomer hitting thirty five off off Stuart Broad, and then England um, taking down another 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 run chase that really should not have been possible against the bowling attack of that sort of quality, um, and and making it into uh, an absolute cakewalk. So I think that was, again, an astonishing test match. Also, I think um, Ben Stokes' captaincy in India's second innings, where India found themselves in that sort of rock and a hard place between not quite knowing how, how hard they needed to go in order to get far enough ahead. They, they probably should have put themselves 450 in front, not the three, just the paltry 378 or whatever it was that England had to chase down. But, um, you know, Stokes and, and the bowlers who, who just attacked the whole time, you know, there was no sort of sense of trying to stem the run flow, um, managed to sort of confound India and befuddled them, I think, with, with sort of that overly aggressive um, intent. Uh, and, and in doing so, sort of stopped them from putting the game out of England's reach altogether. Uh, and so, you know, all of that turned that into a, a, a wonderful occasion. Obviously, being Birmingham, being India as well, the support was 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 huge. The buzz around the England team, having uh, just finished off the the New Zealanders not not long before, was was at its height. Um, and so, yeah, it was a, a pretty memorable test. Mm. And especially after England did what they did against New Zealand, there was a sense of go on. Then can you, can you do it again? Can you do it against a slightly better side? And so they, they, they could, they could. Um, and then moving on to your player of the summer, someone who you you saw a lot of. Um, well, I guess after the summer in Pakistan as well. Yeah, um, well, I think Harry Brook. I mean, and, and that that um, obviously he he did a lot of his great stuff behind closed doors or, or behind the sort of the county cricket paywall, if you like. Um, at the beginning of the season, at one point, I think he was averaging over 150 for Yorkshire, and then sort of you know carried drinks around with England, got a bit, got his chance in that uh, oval Test match in, in the absence of, of Bearstow, who you know, to all intents and purposes, was everybody's player of the summer. So it would have been boring to to call his name. Um, and then, uh, and then during the course of the, the the series in Pakistan, played some of the some of the most outrageous um, and skillful and bordering on genius, genius strokes. In the in the you know in the midst of playing very very consistently over over a series in which Pakistan's bowlers were pretty damn good, so um, you know he met he's the coming man I suppose, um, and for that reason I'm I'm picking him as my as my player of the summer, mm. but everybody knows it's best though right? Yeah, well, I mean it's, it's also quite interesting that Best is now ruled out of the Pakistan Test series. We know he's not going to play cricket again this year, and it's going to be. Almost certainly going to be Brook in the middle order and potentially duck it up at the top. So two of the guys who did really well in that T20 series are going to get an opportunity, could get an opportunity again in Pakistan later in the year. Yeah, they they certainly could. And and um, you know, I, I spoke to both of them whilst I was out there, and, and Ben Duckett was absolutely loving being being a part of it. Um, he's one of those guys, and 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 look back because this might be a bit of a theme coming out of my mouth, but one of those guys who kind of has had a go at, at, at the highest level and was found. Um, was found wanting for whatever reason. He wouldn't. He's not the first person that's ever happened to. But has kind of gone away, matured a bit, become a better player, um, and looks to be absolutely thriving as a sort of more mature 
um, you know, first class cricketer and uh, white ball cricketer as well. So good luck to him because he's he's wildly talented. And um, and Pakistan will give uh, one or two right arms to have a player of his quality outside of their uh, their white ball squad at the moment. Mm. Yeah, well, um, the the schedule never stops for England. They they head off to Australia very shortly, and then the T20 World Cup will start in a couple of weeks. Um, cheers your time, Butch. We'll see you in the studio next week. So now, the listeners, um, we had loads on Bearstow, understandably, Trent Bridge and Headingley out in front. I'll read one of them out. Uh, Nicholas Rowland says, my moment of the summer is Johnny Bearstow's 100 at Trent Bridge and the subsequent win against New Zealand. It felt like the liftoff moment for this new era and was such a fun day of test cricket to watch. Who knew letting people, predominantly students, in for free would work? Um, I'm going to pick out some of the more niche ones because there were some brilliant niche We do like, we do like niche. Um, and yeah, some of these are great. So Peter writes in to say, George Scrimshaw bowling the last over of a T20 blast game at home for Derbyshire against Lancashire. He went for a shed load in his first three overs. The crowd was in a state of shock when chosen to bowl his last over with minimal runs needed to win. He won't, went for only one run from recollection, recollection and he got a wicket in there for good measure as well. I mean, George Grimshaw was another player who might have had a breakout summer getting to the England Lions squad. Um, Robert O'Sullivan says, Hi guys, both moments of the year for me involve Irish cricket. The first is the rise of Irish players not named Paul Sterling in various domestic leagues around the world. Josh Little tore up the 100, going from a mid-season replacement to one of the bowlers of the tournament. And Harry Tector went okay in the CPL as well. And then in the first ODI between India and Ireland, the camera showed a sign that read, From Mumbai to Dublin just to see Surya Kumar play. Of course, referring to Indian batting ace Surya Kumar Yadav, who was then, giving out, who, who was then given out LBW to Craig Young, first ball. Um, felt sorry for that fan who travelled so far, but it was deeply, deeply funny. Um, that's very good. And then Ben Turner, another pretty niche one. He writes in to say, an honourable mention for a moment this summer surely goes to Ben Green for his 157 off 84 balls against Durham in the Royal London One Day Cup. Needing 140 to win in 14 overs with two wickets left, Green was left on a run. Green was on a run of ball 35. He then hit 123 of his next 49 balls, which included 12 sixes, and his second 50 came off just 14 balls. He hit four sixes in an over twice, and his single-handed effort almost took Somerset over the line. Had he not hold out in the last over, giving Durham the win, it would surely have been one for the ages. An absolute. Gem of an innings that may have flown under the ray under the radar by virtue of the competition it was played in. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you, Ben? I remember you tweeting <laughs> almost pulled off one of the great heists. Yeah, which I, which I, I absolutely stand by. I mean, and having that read out only emphasises more how completely <laughs> absurd that was. I was at, yeah, absolutely hooked to that finish, um, and yeah, it was was an incredible, incredible innings. Mm. Um, James Tapper says there were just some fantastic championship game finishes. Overall, Essex chasing 84 to beat Somerset and winning by one wickets up there. Also, the the George Balderson hat-trick in the game where Glenn Chappell wasn't particularly happy about the pitch and then Lancashire ended up winning. Uh, and then finally, let's go to David Shervington. Shervo, who we first heard from at this show last year, where he basically explained that he first got into test, first got into cricket by listening to Alistair Cook um, score his farewell 100 on the radio and he got into cricket more and more over, over the three years in between and then finally went to a test match last summer. So he says, you might remember that last year I saw my first live test match and submitted that as my moment of the summer. This year's moment of the summer is hard to pin down, perhaps scoring my first ever competitive runs at the ripe old age of 36. No one warned me about the giddy feeling of seeing actual numbers against my name on a scorecard. Actually, though, I think my moment of the summer would be the Sunday afternoon a few weeks ago when we took the kids and a bat and a ball to the local playing field. Out of nowhere, my wife abandoned just abandoned just throwing the ball underarm and suddenly started bowling some lovely loopy stuff in my direction. In the field stood the three-year-old and the six-year-old ready to chase off the ball the minute daddy whacked it over the bowler's head. The family aren't quite cricket fans yet, but the process is starting and it feels inevitable. Like when the kids get a cold and you think, you better make sure we've got enough paracetamol for when we catch it off them. It turns out cricket is seriously contagious as well. It's another lovely 
email from David. Um, and I feel like we're all invested in the in, in the journey of the Sherrington family as they get more and more into cricket. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's part of the family now. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, anyway, thanks so much for sending all of those in. That is all we have time for today. We'll be back next week where Ben Jones from CrickViz will be joining us to talk through the list that Joe talked about earlier. And Butch will be back in the studio after his tour of Pakistan. <laughs>